Kusundika Buffalo Eater Agahidika Salmon Eater Okandika Dust Eater Tuyani Mountain Dweller Tukudika Sheep Eater Shoshone A short time ago, I learned that among the mountain crows there lived an old woman who was the very last of her tribe and who was so old she seemed like a spirit from another world. She had outlived her people and had wandered away from her home on the mountains into the valleys, living on berries and wild fruit as she wandered. She alone could read the painted rocks and tell their meaning and could relate the past glories of the tribe and the methods of the arrow makers who transformed the obsidian into the finished arrows ready to kill the mountain ram. Bill Allen, in 1877, prospecting for gold in the vicinity of the Bighorn Mountains, encountered the old woman he had heard about. Later, in 1913, he published a romantic book entitled The Sheep Eaters. Though unsubstantiated, the book weaves a provocative tale of a lost culture of mountain-dwelling Indians who depended on the Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep for their survival and who came to a tragic end. In the sand lies a dead cedar torn from the mountaintop and crashing down the canyon. It was carried by the rushing waters out into the beach and deposited in the sand. Sitting on a branch of this cedar is an old woman her white locks hang crisp and short on her bony shoulders. Her face is covered with a semi-parchment, brown as the forest leaves, and drawn tight over her high cheekbones. The last of her race. Yes, long ago her people have become extinct. But death does not claim her, and she wanders alone until picked up by the mountain Absarokis. I sat down by her side and asked her by sign talk, are you a Sioux? Well, she shook her head. Are you a Blackfoot? Again, she shook her head. I made many signs of the different tribes, but in the crow sign, she said no to them all. She held her withered arm high above her head and said in sign language, My people lived among the clouds. We were the sheep eaters who have passed away, but on those walls are the paint rocks where our traditions are written on their face. Our people were not warriors. We worshiped the sun, and the sun is bright, and so were our people. Our men were good, and our women were like the sun. Our people never came down into the valleys, but always lived among the clouds, eating the mountain sheep and the goats, and sometimes the elk when they came high on the mountains. Our teepees were made of the cedar, thatched with gray moss and cemented with the gum from the pines, carpeted with the mountain sheepskins, soft as down. Our garments are made from the skins of the gazelle and ornamented with eagle feathers and ermine and otter skins. We chanted our songs to the sun and the great spirit was pleased. He gave us much sheep and meat and berries and pure water and snow to keep the flies away. The water was never mu muddy. We had no dogs, no horses. We did not go far from our homes, but were happy. Who were the sheep eaters, these mysterious mountain people? In the diaries of fur trappers and other early explorers can be found references to timid mountain dwellers and poor Indians who had no horses and hunted only with bow and arrow. They spoke a Shoshone dialect, but it is evident that they were different from the Mounted Plains Shoshone who hunted buffalo with British rifles and fought great Indian wars. 
Some authorities believe they migrated north out of the Great Basin of California and Nevada, where Shoshone-speaking people had maintained a hunter-gatherer lifestyle for millennia. But there is also reason to believe that they may have been descended from the prehistoric inhabitants of the Yellowstone region. Evidence is scant, but the accounts of early explorers and the work of archaeologists and anthropologists have given us compelling clues to the origins of this mysterious mountain people. Osborne Russell, a farm boy from Maine, made five visits to the wild Yellowstone Plateau as a fur trapper in the early 19th century. One of his favorite spots he called his secluded valley was the Lamar Valley in northeastern Yellowstone. In 1835, Russell encountered a small band of Snake Indians who seemed utterly content in their high mountain home. We found a few Snake Indians comprising six men, seven women, and eight or ten children who were the only inhabitants of this lonely and secluded spot. They were all neatly clothed in dressed deer and sheepskins of the best quality and seemed to be perfectly happy. Their personal property consisted of one old butcher knife, nearly worn to the back, two shattered fuses, which had long since become useless for want of ammunition, a small stone pot and about 30 dogs on which they carried their skins, clothing, provisions on their hunting excursions. The Shoshone Indians had a tradition of designating different groups of their tribe by their primary food sources. Thus, the mounted Shoshone, also known as Snake or Bannock, who hunted buffalo on the high plains were called Kusundika, or buffalo eaters. The Shoshone who harvested the abundant salmon of the Snake and Lemhi rivers in Idaho were known as Agaidika, or salmon eaters and the relatively small isolated groups of Shoshone who lived high in the mountains for most of the year and hunted the Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep were called the Tukudika, or sheep eaters. But evidence has surfaced that might suggest the Shoshone people as a whole are descended from prehistoric inhabitants of Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming. Archaeological evidence in the vicinity of Yellowstone National Park dates back to 11,500 years ago. Could the sheep eaters, with their Stone Age traditions, have been descended from the mammoth hunters? Les Davis of Montana State University has extensively studied the prehistorical archaeology of Montana. All of the peoples who lived in Montana, beginning about 11,500 years ago, right up to about 200 or so years ago, were hunter-gatherers. They were highly mobile people, semi-nomadic, who moved around from time to time, seasonally, to stay close to the various kinds of food resources on which they were dependent. They were food collectors. As such, they covered an enormous amount of space. They didn't live in permanent villages over long periods nor did they necessarily return to a particular campsite year after year after year. The Shoshoneans uh, seem to be uh, manifested in the archaeological record by the extensive use of obsidian for making arrow points, the use of steatite pipes, the use of steatite pots, and the production of a very uh, fragile but useful type of earthenware pottery fired in open fireplaces. Uh, they, they used wickiups, these conical timber lodges. Those are the kinds of artifacts and the kind of life way that was being followed by the sheep eaters at the time of initial historical contact with them. And it's on the basis of that kind of logic, which is strong, but a record which is fragile, that would suggest that peoples who were ancestral to the historic Shoshonean groups here may well have lived in the Rocky Mountains of Montana for some uh, time prior to that. Regardless of their ancestry, we do know that the sheep eaters retained a Stone Age lifestyle. They traveled in small bands because their food supply would not sustain large groups. Movement is the name of the game, really, of, of the life way for hunter-gatherers. But they would, in an ordinary course of affairs, the sheep eaters would 
uh, simply go somewhere else and join their relatives. Two bands would merge to form one band. One group would move away to join another band or another one. They say the flexibility of membership in these local residential groups is remarkable and certainly one of the most important of the survival strategies that hunters and gatherers developed. But as time went on and the buffalo became scarce on the plains, other Indians began to encroach on the sheep eaters. In Allen's book, the old woman, Agretta, tells of the aggressive Sioux attacking her mountain sheep eater camp. Then came the Sioux who killed the elk and the buffalo in the valleys. They had swarms of dogs and horses and ran the game until it left the valleys and went far away. Our chief met them on the steep precipice and ordered them to stop where they were, but they murmured and made signs of battle. Our people had great masses of rock as large as houses where they could let them loose down the trail and crash the Sioux into the earth as they were all down in a deep canyon. The time had come for action and the sheep eaters assembled at the narrow trail headed by their chieftain, Red Eagle. Great excitement prevailed. The squaws and children had hidden among the rocks with all their robes and earthly possessions. The wild and savage Sioux knew no fear and were pressing up the narrow trail with war paint and feathers. Their grim visages scowling in the sunlight as they came. Red Eagle, with that bravery known only to his tribe, waited until they had reached the most dangerous precipice. Then, with a great lever that had been prepared years before, he loosened the great rock from its moorings, and with one crash it sped down the canyon like a cyclone. The screams of the terrified Indians, the howling of dogs, and the neighing of horses were heard in one awful roar. The battle was over. The religion of the sheep eaters, though it is little known, must have made sense out of the unpredictable world of the Rocky Mountains. The mountain dwellers learned to maintain a delicate balance between the forces of nature and their own survival. A view has been held by some anthropologists over the years that natives were frightened of, scared of, or terrified by the geysers in Yellowstone National Park, and that they tended to avoid them. Well, this certainly may be the case, but archeological evidence of the occupation in the park, including right up uh, proximal to, or nearby uh, geysers in the park today, suggests that prehistoric people were very familiar with and intermittently, intermittently present and camped and hunted in the vicinity of, of geysers. I think a more reasonable point of view is that these are, as some have referred to them in the past, the primitive pragmatists. Uh, these people weren't scared of their own shadow. They were largely in control of the, the world in which they lived and they used spiritual means uh, to assist them in establishing and maintaining harmony with those forces in their world which uh, appeared to be often uh, unpredictable. They were certainly uh, well established in their relationships with the, the game on which they were dependent. They uh, had a good close working relationships with all of the elements of the sky and the earth and the weather. It's essential to maintain that kind of harmony if uh, man was to be the beneficiary of the gifts and he was so dependent upon these parts of his world that he did everything in his power 
to keep everything in balance. Much of the sheep eaters' food, clothing, and weapons was extracted from one animal, the Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep, though they utilized other animals as they were available. The sheep eaters also gathered roots and berries, even insects, to supplement their diet. They schedule their movements from one campsite to another campsite based on foreknowledge and prior knowledge of when plants are becoming available. Many of the plants have only about a 10 day or a two week window during which they can be collected before they go to seed. So these people have an intimate familiarity of all of the mineral, vegetable, and animal resources that are available in their environment and have to be able to uh, very accurately predict when and where these resources become available. In the winters, the sheep eaters would continue their perpetual movement in pursuit of food and shelter. The general pattern is to move to lower elevation along rivers uh, that flow during the winter, if at all possible, to get the shelter from the cruel winter winds, to avoid deep snow, and to get fuel. And of course, a good many of the game species were also driven out of high elevation down into a lower elevation, and so were uh, potentially available to hunters and gatherers living in river bottoms the best, most reasonable proposition that people will abandon the deep snow areas. After all, there's nothing there. But everything else has moved out. One beautiful day, when sun warm and earth green, white man got lost and his ponies came into our camp. White man very sick. Medicine man put him in big teepee and take care of him. Give him much bath in hot water. Man got very red like Indian man. Face much all over spots. By and by he die. Then sickness all over camp. Sheep eater 
run off in the forest and die. Some run to other villages, they all die. Sheep eater, all much scared and run away. Many teepee standing alone, all dead inside. Red eagle die, red arrow die. Me no die, me very much scare. Go off in mountains, eat berries, cherries, rest. Me find many sheep eater dead in woods. By and by, sheep eaters, not many. They go to other Indian tribes down in valley on river where much big water runs. Then sheep eater no more, no more papoose, no more straw, all gone. Cold winds go, spring come, wild geese come back to lakes. Sheep eater no come back, all gone. Teepee rot, rain, wind, snow, sun, on bones, on blankets, teepees, skins, bows, arrows. By and by, all gone too. India no go there a long time, many moon. For a while, at least, the sheep eaters managed to keep their simple world in balance with nothing more than the primary resources of wild plants and animals, and an intimate knowledge of the natural ecology. In the end, they were crippled by white men's diseases, and the few remaining in the mountains were forced onto reservations. In their millennia of existence, they took little from the earth, and they learned to live with the earth in harmony. Perhaps that is why they are so fascinating to us. In our age of computers and artificial environments, it is somehow reassuring to know that the human species can exist without our technological shroud. In reviewing the life of the sheep eaters, perhaps we disclose a deep longing as well as a need to rediscover our own balance with the natural world.